Happy Friday, everybody. James Hancock here. I'm back to talk about episode three of WandaVision on Disney+. Plus. If you have not yet seen the episode, this is not the video for you because I will be discussing spoilers, but I strongly encourage everyone who's on the fence to watch the first episode and see for themselves if they might be into it. When you have a show that's such a dramatic, stylistic departure from what's come before in a giant franchise like the MCU, it's not surprising at all that this show is not for everyone. But as we saw in the final scene this episode, and once again, spoiler alert, the real MCU that fans are familiar with and, and craving is waiting just outside the town limits of Westview. And it wouldn't surprise me at all if by the end of this season, WandaVision will basically run out of different decades of television to explore, and that we'll be seeing Wanda and Vision interacting with the world outside of this fantasy reality that she has created. But before I get to my official review, I want to plug a video I made last week where I did the deep dive into roughly 50 years of Marvel Comics history, where I discussed all my favorite storylines about Wanda and Vision, their children, Vision's death and subsequent reassembly, and most important of all, the many occasions where Wanda's powers ran amok and how during key chapters in Marvel history, Wanda has proven herself to be one of the most terrifying villains in Marvel Comics. And I'll include a link to that video in the video notes below, but the reason I bring this up is because Episode 3 of WandaVision has officially opened the door to many of these storylines possibly being explored in this show and the MCU movies that come after. Now, I have to admit that I almost took a pass on reviewing this episode. The tone was initially so silly that I was thinking to myself that maybe I would try again next week. Also, to be fair, 32 minutes of programming doesn't give us a ton to talk about, especially when you have a six-minute closing credit sequence plus the opening credits, which announced that we are officially in the 1970s, the era of the Partridge family and the Brady Bunch, along with all the appropriate hairstyles for the characters. And this episode was all about the birth of Tommy and Billy, an event that took place way back in 1986 in issue 12 of The Vision and the Scarlet Witch. Doctor Strange himself was there to handle the delivery. But in the context of this show, Wanda's pregnancy was unusual, to put it mildly, which honestly is to be expected anytime a synthesoid and a reality-warping spellcaster decide to have a family. And throughout the episode, Wanda loses control over her powers repeatedly, resulting in all sorts of wackiness throughout the episode, like a giant bird stepping out of her wallpaper, all while they try to keep this whirlwind pregnancy a secret from the neighborhood. But while I was initially totally uninterested in the silly side of this episode, in particular watching Vision in fast motion, what finally grabbed my attention were the hints of darkness that reminded me of the classic Twilight Zone episode, It's a Good Life, where we see a family living in complete terror, all at the mercy of this child who can reshape reality however he likes. Because toward the end of this episode, after Geraldine, aka Monica Rambeau, mentions the death of Pietro during the final battle against Ultron, we saw a hint of just how scary and dangerous Wanda might become. Honestly, Wanda was looking at Geraldine in almost the same fashion that she stared down Thanos when she took him on during the climax to Avengers Endgame. And this kind of material is what really grabs me. None of us know for sure what direction the MCU is headed, but whether Wanda goes insane and breaks the universe into fragments, hence her appearance in Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, or if they decide to let her go full villain and lash out at her friends and allies, I am totally on board for all of it. What was interesting in this episode was watching how Vision, Agnes, and Herb are all pushing back on this elaborate fantasy Wanda's constructed. In Herb's case, quite literally, as he uses an electric saw to carve through the bricks separating their driveways. I'm not quite sure what that symbolizes, but I imagine we'll learn after the fact what he's really up to. But as long as these characters are not in Wanda's direct line of sight, they seem to have a fair amount of autonomy. But when Vision's talking to Wanda and raises his concern that something might be amiss, she simply rewinds the show and has him deliver a different line, one that's heartbreaking sweet and gets a proper ooh and off ah from the live studio audience. The big question for me is whether or not Vision will remain fully operational if this fantasy were to end. We saw Vision killed twice in Avengers Infinity War, once by Wanda to try and save the universe and once by Thanos after he used the Time Stone to wind back the clock and rip the Mind Stone from Vision's forehead. My hope is that by season's end, Vision is fully restored with a proper replacement for the Mind Stone. But the even bigger question is what is the agenda of Agnes and Herb? I share the suspicion of many out there that Agnes is in fact Agatha Harkness and that Herb is Herbert Edgar Wyndham, aka the High Evolutionary. I don't want to reiterate everything I already covered in my History of Wanda and Vision video that I mentioned before because once again that link is in the video notes below, but suffice to say in the comics, Agatha is a powerful witch who trained Wanda and the High Evolutionary is this super genius mad scientist who offered safety to Wanda and Pietro's mother when she was giving birth. My theory 
is that they recognize that Wanda is in this deep state of trauma over losing vision and that she needs to be monitored and looked after in order to try and guide her safely back to the realm of sanity. Or who knows, perhaps their agenda is more nefarious, but that would be a big departure from the source material. What was interesting to me was how they were so suspicious of Geraldine, how they keep emphasizing that she's not from around here. And clearly she's in bed with S.W.O.R.D. judging by the necklace she wears, and S.W.O.R.D. being the agency that is investigating this metahuman crisis. My belief is that Agnes and Herb have a completely different agenda from S.W.O.R.D., and that if anything, S.W.O.R.D.'s militant response to this crisis might even serve to push Wanda further over the edge. Also, if anyone has a strong theory over who Ralph might be, I'm all ears, but Agnes seems to bring him up every episode. The unknown variable or the X factor in all this is Hydra. We keep seeing these weird Hydra branded commercials, in the case of this episode, a bubble bath. Now these could just be weird flashbacks to when Hydra first gave Wanda her powers at the end of Captain America Winter Soldier, but perhaps at that time, Hydra knew that they were creating what amounts to a ticking time bomb and that eventually Wanda would snap under the strain of her abilities. But I'm all for Hydra once again, playing a bigger role in the MCU. And just to be clear about Wanda's abilities, they're considerable. I saw some comments on my video last week where some folks were underestimating her powers overall in spite of the evidence in front of them that she can rewrite the laws of reality. Because in the comics on four separate occasions from the 1970s through the early 2000s, anytime her sanity came unspooled, either through possession or through emotional trauma, she would end up taking on the Avengers all by herself. And on all four occasions, she either held her own or won outright, oftentimes killing her closest friends and allies I'm not saying that's where we're necessarily headed for certain in the MCU, but if, like in the comics, the season ends with Agnes proving to Wanda that Tommy and Billy do not in fact exist, Wanda just might snap. That said, I highly doubt that this show will go into Master Pandemonium and Mephisto territory, but if it does, I would totally welcome it. I'll leave you with this weird image of Master Pandemonium just to tease you what might be coming our way, but I think the likelihood of this storyline is minimal at best. In any case, the episode ends with a glimpse of the military operation outside of Westview. It reminded me a bit of that sci-fi film from a couple years ago, Annihilation, where you had that force field that just keeps expanding and changing all the laws of physics within it. And if Wanda's realm is expanding, that could be a cool, alarming twist. What I want to know is why S.W.O.R.D. has yet to bring in a single member of the Avengers to lend a hand. If we were to get a big cameo between now and the season finale, folks would absolutely lose their minds because it's been, what, like almost two years at this point since we've seen the Avengers in action? And if I were to pick someone to make a cameo, I would have to go with Hawkeye because both in Age of Ultron as well as in Civil War, we see that Wanda's always had this affection for Clint Barton, a.k.a. Jeremy Renner. So if he wants to make a cameo, bring it on. But I think that's all I got for now. I remain totally invested in the show, but I think the first episode remains the strongest. So I'm still waiting for that big twist episode that blows all of our minds. But if I had to place myself in a particular camp related to this show, I would say I am a fan. I'm just not like a rabid fan, at least not quite yet. But having the MCU back in our lives for the next six Fridays, I'm totally on board. And if you want to talk more about Marvel Comics or the MCU or whatever, give me a shout on Twitter at Colbrax. And if you enjoyed this review, please consider liking the video, subscribing to the channel. That's super helpful. But hope everyone has an amazing weekend. But more importantly, as always, onwards and upwards.